So, uh, good day everyone and thank you for joining. Uh, today's workshop is a part of DST CPR's Open Science South Asia Networks Initiative and is uh, organized jointly by uh, Indian Institute of Science Library, DST CPR IIC, and DataSci. Today's workshop is focused on unlocking repositories through persistent identifiers, enabling open research practices. The discussions on open science put a renewed interest in the institutional repositories. Institutional repositories can play a crucial role in open science by facilitating research data and article sharing. However, to make research article discoverable and to make research data fair, we need persistent identifier. PIDs are unique and permanent identifiers that can be used to identify and cite research output over time. This is important for open research because it allows researchers to share their work with others to, and to track their impact. So if there is any object that is uh, stored in the data repository, institutional data repository, they would need PIDs to cite it, to make it discoverable, and also, of course, to track, it, track its impact. Digital object identifier, DOI, is a type of P PID, and we will explore the use and necessities of DOI in this workshop. And that's where the role of data sites comes in, because data site is a nonprofit organization and who provides DOIs to many repositories uh, such as Zenodo. So in today's workshop, we will co cover the following topic. Introduction to persistent identifiers and their importance. Making institutions research data fair. The value of integrating repositories with DOIs and data size global access program in fostering uh, PID's adoption worldwide. For today's workshop, we have three speakers. Uh, and uh, the three speakers will speak and we will take the questions at the end of the whole session. So today's first speaker is Dr. Uh, Francis Jekka. He is the scientific officer at JRD Data, Li Data Library, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, and an open access advocate. ISS repository is the oldest in India, and he has been associated with this initiative from the inception. I would request Dr. Francis to share his thought on institutional repositories, and as well as on the data repositories and the need to share data. Uh, Dr. Francis, the floor yes. is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Maumita. And uh, good afternoon, um, all the panelists. Good afternoon, all the participants. Um, as Mamita said, um, uh, we will have uh, three uh, presentations. Uh, so I will uh, talk about uh, Mohammed and uh, Gabriella will talk about uh, 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 the DOI perspective or the PID perspective for an institutional repository, institutional data repository. And before they do that, I thought, uh, let me very quickly run through the importance of uh, institutional data repository. Now, for, um, for, for the audience who are uh, participating in this event, uh, you, you all of you are very familiar with uh, institutional, the concept of institutional repository itself, which uh, emerged with the emergence of uh, the open access uh, concept uh, in the early late 90s or so. So the concept of institutional repository for research publications is very well established and it's very well put to practice and uh, uh, the library community is very familiar with it. And many of the libraries uh, across the world have taken the initiative in setting up and maintaining institutional repositories for research publications. Now, the research uh, institutional repositories for data, research data, although uh, the idea and the concept is uh, quite old, I would say it's almost uh, 15 years old uh, since uh, the importance for institutional data repositories have uh, um, uh, the gained importance for the last decade or so. Uh, but uh, it has not really caught up, uh, especially in India. Now, if you if you look uh, look at um, the 
uh, re3data.org, one of the uh, registries to find out what uh, data repositories exist uh, in the country. Now, although it, it lists about 60 odd uh, repositories, but none of these repositories are from an academic institute, uh, from, an, from an academic institutions. Although there are 60 odd uh, repositories listed there, now most of these uh, repositories pertain to uh, government data and other uh, ministries and uh, departments, uh, both from the central and the state governments. But uh, very surprisingly, I didn't uh, come across uh, any repository uh, from an academic institution. I, I'm not sure how up-to-date uh, the registry is, but uh, as of yesterday, I didn't uh, see a single uh, academic institution being listed in uh, uh, re3data.org. Uh, okay. So um, there is a need uh, for the institutions to, uh, especially the libraries uh, associated with the institutions, to take on priority uh, in setting up uh, institutional data repositories so that they can interlink the uh, repository that they already have for um, uh, research publications with uh, the corresponding data repositories. Dr. And, Francis, sorry, yeah. uh, uh, will you share the screen now or? Yeah, I will, I will. So okay, I, I, I'm not it uh, started my- Oh, okay, uh, sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, uh, so that uh, the, the data can be preserved long time and there are many advantages of um, having a data repository, which uh, we will shortly uh, look into. And um, and uh, the libraries uh, should come forward and take the lead. So this is uh, just a beginning uh, uh, going forward. We hope to conduct um, uh, several more uh, workshops, um, uh, practical workshops, wherein we will try to impart training in setting up and maintaining uh, institutional data repository. Now, with uh, if you would uh, kindly excuse me, I would turn off my video and I will share my screen and start my presentation. So I've just shared my screen. Um, so can I get a feedback about uh, the visibility of my yes. uh, screen? It's okay. visible, it's visible. Okay. Thank you very much, okay. So, um, uh, so I have uh, prepared um, my uh, my present talk for about 2023 20, slides. So, in the interest of time, I may not go through each and every slide, uh, but I will broadly touch upon the points that have uh, listed here. I will start with a, a introduction, then I will talk about uh, research data and its importance and uh, its impact on scientific progress. And then um, having the research data, how, how do you manage it? So, uh, so research data management, what are the challenges associated with the research data management? And then um, how do you manage uh, uh, research data? So we need to have a uh, research uh, data repository for that. And then there are already uh, several uh, data repositories. And then if you want, one wants to find um, uh, what are the, how, how does one go about? Okay, and then, um, uh, so there are different types of data repositories and one of the types is uh, institutional data repository. So what services do the institutional data uh, repositories provide? What role does uh, data IRs play? And then how does one go about in implementing uh, data IR? And then are there any funding uh, and um, support mechanism for uh, implementing an institutional data? And then what is the vision of uh, my library in setting up uh, the, our institute's uh, uh, data repository? So these are, the, uh, uh, these are the points I will be broadly touching upon. Now in the... Uh, um, uh, recent decades, uh, there has been explosion of uh, computational power and uh, the availability of uh, big data. 
Now, these have revolutionized um, research that is carried out in various fields. Now, these days, research is uh, data-driven. Now, uh, be it uh, in the field of science or engineering or social science or humanities, now it's all predominantly uh, data-driven research. Uh, so uh, during a research process, uh, the researchers uh, collect data. Now, uh, now the, the, the data is so collected during the process of uh, research uh, has to be managed. Now, um, now these days, as we know, uh, uh, there is a, we need the requisite uh, IT infrastructure to manage the data that, that is collected, analyzed, and uh, then uh, make inferences and conclusions. Okay. So uh, management of research data becomes extremely important. And um, that's where uh, the role of uh, data repositories come in. Okay. So the uh, data repositories, they serve as a centralized platforms for managing research data during the, not just during the course of uh, research investigation, but for posterity. And, uh, and uh, in the process now, in, in the present context, in the context of open access, open research and open science, uh, sharing that uh, research data that has been so painstakingly and so much of time has been devoted for that. So uh, you need uh, platforms for managing uh, research data that's been collected and you need to preserve that. And then you, know, you have to share that so that um, uh, uh, it, uh, it helps in various other ways which we will be talk about. So when the, when the research data is uh, shared openly, uh, what does it uh, entail? So it facilitates transparency and it, uh, it facilitates collaboration. And in the process, there is a scientific progress involved. Okay. Uh, so there are uh, several benefits uh, in setting up uh, research data repositories and then making data in such repositories open. Okay. Of course, uh, there are challenges in implementing data repositories. So uh, we will see what those challenges are. And then uh, uh, if uh, one has to explore the funding possibilities, opportunities, both nationally and internationally. Uh, so I will very briefly touch upon that also. So uh, let's get started with what research data is. So uh, research data is essentially a raw material that the researchers uh, collect, process, uh, and uh, undertake studies on that um, while carrying out research investigation. Okay, so it uh, essentially serves as a basis uh, that substantiates uh, published research findings. Okay, now depending on the field in which the research is carried out, now be it um, uh, in the domain of science or engineering or humanities, uh, there are uh, one or more than one way of collecting uh, research data. Now, it could be uh, by way of observation, uh, it could be through experiments, it could be through simulation, or it could be derived or compiled data, or it could be referential data. Okay, so depending on the field, so it could be any one of these methods, or it could be combination of these methods to collect uh, research material um, uh, which serves as a raw, which serves as a raw material for the research in hand. So, uh, uh, importance of uh, research data uh, and its impact on scientific uh, progress. Okay. Okay. So now, uh, when the data is openly available. Um, so that uh, it becomes easily um, findable and uh, <clears throat> uh, others can make use of uh, data, then there is scope for uh, reproduce, ver verifying the, uh, the, the research that has been derived or research that has been uh, concluded uh, from the raw material that has been uh, collected over the, for the research purpose. So, when the data is openly shared, 
someone else can verify the data they can build upon it they can um, identify the potential uh, errors and also shortcomings okay so th this is one uh, very important uh, aspect uh, that when the data is openly available uh, then others can uh, uh, verify the results and also if required the methods the assumptions and the conclusions uh, can be reproduced so that that possibility uh, becomes possible only when when the data that is being used for research investigation has been made openly available and there is uh, transparency and then accountability okay now when the, when the data is openly available and when somebody can verify and reproduce it and they can find out i mean uh, whether there has been any um, uh, any bias in uh, while interpreting the data and it also uh, enhances the uh, the integrity of uh, the research itself when data is openly available and uh, when other people can easily find such data then it gives scope for collaboration now people from other domains may get interested and collaborate um, uh, with uh, uh, th th there is a scope for collaboration there is scope for interdisciplinary collaboration and then um, when complex problems are done collaboratively then uh, it, it the solu finding solution becomes faster uh, and easier so um, uh, openness of data uh, facilitates collaboration and innovation long term impact and legacy now today the researchers have carried out research based on the data the raw material that um, they gathered for their research work and then uh, they have um, uh, drawn inferences come to conclusions and then uh, the, they have tested their hypothesis and uh, uh, they, they i mean they go on so when the data is left behind the, the next generation of researcher can revisit can reevaluate re re the data and then they can build upon it so there's a scope for that uh, so for that to happen one needs to have access to uh, the data uh, <clears throat> resource allocation and funding okay um, so especially when it comes to funding uh, when researcher is applying for a grant and then if it is uh, i mean they always see what uh, the researchers uh, the previous contributions have been okay so if uh, uh, if a particular researcher has done quality research work and uh, the data gathered is of uh, good quality and definitely that will um, that will give an edge for a researcher to get uh, subsequent funding from the funding agencies okay okay now uh, 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 definitely there are uh, challenges in uh, research data management now first of all uh, in the present era of data driven research now depending on um, a domain the amount of data that is uh, gathered or amount of data that is required to carry out research investigation will uh, is surely dependent on um, uh, a particular uh, domain okay um, now for example certain domains suppose uh, if it is in the field of um, uh, uh, atmospheric science or uh, environment or uh, if it is uh, astro astronomy the amount of data collected is enormous so in order to store such enormous amount of data you need um, um, uh, requisite infrastructure for that okay so now it's uh, now many of the institutions especially in the developing countries may not have the required infrastructure and resources to sustain and support um, uh, data of huge quantity for long term okay so that's def definitely uh, one of the big challenges okay now when it comes to awareness uh, now still many researchers are not uh, have, have the requisite awareness about making the data open okay now all that uh, a researcher is concerned 
is uh, achieving um, the desired results uh, for a particular research project. Okay, uh, so uh, they they really don't appreciate um, uh, in maintaining uh, or doing a data management for the data that have collected uh, and preserving it for posterity. So uh, uh, awareness has to be created amongst the researchers for uh, awareness about the importance of uh, long-term um, long, long, long -term, uh, preservation of uh, research data. And for that, uh, uh, the library is a, uh, in a good position to offer requisite uh, training to the researchers. Now, data security and uh, uh, privacy. Now, depending on uh, what type of data is uh, collected and what type of uh, data is stored and shared. Okay, so the as uh, the data security and uh, privacy um, will uh, play a significant role. And um, whoever is managing uh, the data should be conscious about uh, data security and uh, uh, data privacy. And uh, uh, so, as I said, there is no awareness, uh, uh, generally, uh, the awareness about um, uh, data sharing is lacking among, amongst the researchers. Now, definitely, with, uh, with the uh, concept of open research, open science catching up, and everybody becoming aware about uh, the, um, the need for open access, uh, so that culture is developing, but still, uh, 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 that mindset uh, is not there for every researcher. Okay? So um, uh, the data share culture has to be imbibed uh, uh, into the researchers uh, so that um, they come forward to share their research data. Uh, otherwise, they're concerned about uh, IPR, they're concerned about competition. And uh, so because of, uh, they cite those reasons for not openly sharing that data. So it becomes the responsibility. So it becomes uh, uh, the responsibility of uh, the institution and the libraries uh, associated with the institutions uh, to create uh, uh, data sharing culture uh, amongst uh, their researchers. Now, having data uh, and then making such data interoperable and then uh, making them standardized, it requires. Uh, uh, enrichment with metadata. So now different domains have different uh, domain specific uh, metadata standards. Okay, so, uh, um, so adhering to these standards will definitely greatly help. But when we do data management and when we do data preservation, uh, this aspect of interoperability and standardization has to be uh, taken into consideration. Of course, uh, long term, uh, the data uh, report the one of the goals of uh, having a data repository is its uh, long term preservation policy framework and institution support also greatly helps now if an institution if we have a policy or open access policy open access mandate either at the national level or at the institutional level uh, then it becomes much easier to um, um, to to implement um, uh, uh, open access uh, mandate uh, in a particular institution. Okay, so institutions uh, should come out with uh, open access mandate, uh, not just for research publications, but for uh, uh, research uh, data as well. And then we need to have requisite institutional support as far as uh, the infrastructure that that is required for um, uh, for uh, data management. So what is a data repository? So uh, according to uh, V3 data, uh, it's a, a subtype of sustainable information infrastructure, which provides long-term storage and access to research data. That is a basis for scholarly publication. Research data means information objects generated by scholarly projects, for example, through experiments, measurements, surveys, or interview. So basically, research data is nothing but the raw data that I was referring to that is collected as a research uh, investigation process.
So that's what, uh, 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 yeah, that, 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 that's uh, research data, the raw materials. And then uh, the management of uh, raw data is done through research uh, data repository. So there are different types of uh, data repositories. Now we have institutional data repositories. Now, uh, if you take Europe and uh, uh, the uh, North America, there are thousands of institutional data repositories uh, which have been in existence for more than a decade now. Um, uh, so across, ac now it's mostly dominated by the Europe and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Western world. But uh, when it comes to India, as I said in the beginning, we don't have institutional da data repository uh, from an academic institution yet. Or I may be wrong because uh, what I'm saying is as per the um, uh, as per the directories that I have looked into, and it's quite possible that some institutions already have, and then that it is not listed in uh, any of the existing uh, uh, directories. But it's time that uh, many of the, um, uh, at least the big uh, centrally funded institutions come out and have their own institutional data repositories so that they can curate uh, the data generated in their respective institutions. Okay, so institutional data repository is uh, broadly one of the three types of uh, data repositories. Then uh, there are domain specific or disciplinary rep uh, repositories. Okay, there are several of them. And some of the best examples include uh, GeneBank. GeneBank uh, has been in existence for a very long time. And uh, the amount of data that is available is uh, enormous. Uh, okay. And then uh, in the field of um, um, uh, uh, physiology, uh, uh, there is a PhysioNet, okay, which is uh, maintained by National Institutes of Health. And there is one um, for political and social sciences. Uh, this is just, just a very uh, few sample uh, examples for domain specific uh, repositories that I have given here. Okay. And there are also general purpose open repositories. Okay. Now, many, many researchers are already, um, uh, uh, already curating their data. Uh, it's that uh, the libraries of those institutions are not aware of it. Okay because some publishers insist that um, uh, if uh, the papers have to be accepted for publications, then the data has to be made openly available. And uh, these are some of the um, open domains, uh, open platforms on which uh, research data can be saved for posterity. So uh, Dryad is one, Fixture, uh, Harvard uh, Dataverse, Zenodo, okay. And uh, uh, many of our researchers, including researchers from our own universe, uh, my own uh, institutions, are uh, having their research data on these platforms. Okay, and uh, th these platforms also um, uh, assign persistent identifiers to the data set so that it becomes um, uh, 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 citable. So I was talking about uh, 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 registries, okay? So from which one can find out uh, uh, information about data repositories themselves, whether you want to find out with respect to uh, how, many, uh, how many repositories are there in a particular country or- uh, Dr. Many... Francis, sorry yeah. to interrupt. Uh, please wrap it up in five minutes because otherwise we will really uh, run out of time from the. Okay, webinar. fine, fine. Okay. Thank you. So uh, there are some registries like uh, the retreat or data, fair sharing catalog, and then scientific data recommended repositories. Okay. Now, uh, an institutional data repository is one which is uh, set up uh, for the benefit of uh, uh, the faculty members and the students carrying out research in their respective uh, uh, universities or institutions. And it's a platform on which the data uh, that is generated as part of a research investigation is curated and uh, the idea is for its long-term preservation and also for 
openly sharing uh, the data. Okay. Now, uh, having set up an institutional repository for data, so it uh, um, it offers uh, uh, several types of services. Now, one of the important services that an institutional data repository offers is um, assigning a digital or uh, assigning a PID. Okay, now PID can be a DOI or it could be based on a handle system. Okay, so that's that's one uh, important value addition. Um, apart from the data management services that the IR uh, support, uh, assigning uh, uh, PIDs for um, for the data sets so that it becomes um, uh, citable. Uh, then once uh, the research data is part of a, a data IR, uh, when it is enriched with the rich metadata, then um, uh, the search engines uh, harvest the metadata details, and in the process, the data sets become uh, discoverable easily. And then, if you already have, uh, if you already have a um, uh, a publications uh, a database, then you can link the publication database with the corresponding uh, data set in the data repository. So I will just skip the other uh, slides in the interest of time, and then I will just briefly talk about uh, uh, um, the vision for uh, IAC libraries, vision for setting up uh, IAC data IR. Okay. Okay, so now, uh, as I said, uh, we already have a, a research repo uh, institutional repository for research publications. Now it's high time for us that we set up an institutional data repository. So um, uh, the, the process has already started and um, uh, we would like to uh, launch it at the earliest. And uh, so it, the, the vision is to have a data IR for managing, preserving, uh, and uh, facilitating open access to research data that is um, that is generated from our institute. Okay. Uh, so uh, the I, the data IR aims to foster a culture of open data sharing, and uh, which in turn facilitates collaboration and transparency uh, within and outside IAC community. So the key objective of IAC data uh, include um, facilitate data sharing, uh, enable researchers to self-archive, manage, and share their research data in a secure and user-friendly way. Encourage uh, data sharing to foster collaboration and interdisciplinary research within and beyond IAC, and ensuring long-term preservation. And as I said, we already have not just one, we have two repositories, one for uh, the uh, research publications and the other for the thesis and dissertations. So uh, the data generated uh, both for the thesis work and also for research publications, if we have the corresponding data in the uh, data IR, then they can be interlinked and uh, that uh, will greatly add value uh, uh, to the IAC research. So with that, uh, I will stop and uh, thank you very much uh, for your patience uh, listening. Thank you, Dr. Francis. This was really a wonderful presentation and I'm, I, I, I'm sure everybody enjoyed it and more so they would have a lot of question and, uh, and this probably with this, we can also uh, start the data repository, probably one of the first in our country for, uh, for, from an a institutional point of view. Uh, I will take the question at the end because that's how we can actually combine if there are similar questions. So right now, then I will uh, invite uh, uh, Gabby. So uh, I will invite uh, Gabriela Meyer. She is the community and program manager of DataSite. She leads DataSite participation in the European Commission's funded project, Fair Impact. She also leads the global access program of DataSite. She will talk about data site and how DOIs can help institutional repository. So without further ado, I would hand over to uh, Gabby. Gabby, the floor is yours. 
Thanks, Mumita. Um, actually, um, we were preparing or planning to have uh, Mohammed's uh, presentation first because it's more um, like a general introduction. So if we can have Mohammed's presentation first and then I will go to, to the second part. Okay, sure. Then uh, I then actually invite then Mohammed uh, to take the floor. But before that, let me just introduce him. He's the regional engagement specialist at DataSite and looks after the engagement in Middle East and Asia. Mohammed joined DataSite in 2023 and he works with the community to build more openness and trust in scholarly infrastructure and supports emerging communities transition toward open research and implementing its principles. Um, so Mohammed and Gabi, you can um, take your flow in this presentation. Sure. Thank you so much, Dr. Momita. Let me share my screen. Yeah, be, before I start, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Francis. I really enjoyed your presentation and you highlighted uh, the importance of the research data repository and the challenges as well uh, in a fantastic way. So thank you so, mu so much, Dr. Francis. So yeah, good afternoon, everyone. So uh, my name is Mohammed Mustafa, the Regional Engagement Specialist for the Middle East and Asia at DataSite. And today in my talk, I'm going to cover three important points. The first one is uh, what are persistent identifiers and the relation with FAIR principles. And I am going to end with an introduction about data site. So we will start with the persistent identifier. So what is a persistent identifier? So it's a unique alphanumerical string, which is always referring to a digital uh, resource. And it will always point to the same uh, resource where the metadata information uh, is presented. So bids can be used and assigned uh, for people, and they can also be used for places, and they can also be used for things. We will explain that in details in the upcoming uh, slides. So bids for people, so we mean by people in that context, we mean academic researchers, we mean translators, we mean contributors to the actual work uh, itself. And we have a, a very important example for a people or researcher identifier in this uh, academic community case, which is ORCID ID. And then bids also can be uh, can refer to and be and assigned and used in the context of research organization. And in that case, we have ROR ID, Research Organization Registry. And in this screenshot that you all can see, it's the ROR ID of the Indian Institute of Science, which we are collaborating with them in this workshop. And then the key message that we want to spread also uh, within this webinar is that DOIs that Dr. Francis highlighted at the and he said uh, in his topic their importance also and we I'm going to explain that in further details they can be used for different research output. So usually journal article we consider journal article which is the common understanding now that in the community is to use DOIs for journal articles but they are just one part of the scholarly record. Uh, DOIs should be assigned and should be used for different research output, such as protocols, data sets, dissertation and thesis, and software and software tools as well that have been created during the research or conducting the research itself. So what is their value? How they can help the different research output? So they will help the different research output in increasing and enhancing their discoverability, the accessibility, the possibility of also getting more citation and reusability as well. So this is a screenshot from a DOI which is assigned to a journal article. And this is a UI also that uh, is assigned and used for a data set. And this is a DOI that, as you can see, that has been assigned for a tool that has been created while conducting the research as well. By using the DOI, this tool now is visible. It's coming in the discovery databases and the discovery citation databases as well. And it's visible for the research community. 
DOIs are now also used for the preprint, the initial version of the article before submitting it to a specific journal or a publisher. So, for example, this is a screenshot from India Archive, the preprint uh, repository server for India, and they are now integrating DOIs for uh, preprints as well. And this is a screenshot from the different registered resources within a data site. And as you can see, we support different research uh, output beyond the journal article. So we have preprint, collection, book chapter, book chapter, software, physical object as well. So now we talked about bids and the different type of bids. Now we are going to talk about the fair principles and their importance for the research data and how bids can support in that context. So the fair principles idea got introduced in this 2016 paper in the published in Nature Scientific Data Journal. And the ultimate goal of the fair principle is to uh, optimize the reuse and maximize the reuse of the data uh, as well. So they con concluded four uh, important principles that the research data should be findable and should be also accessible and should be interoperable and it should be also reusable. So regarding the first principle, uh, findability of the data itself, as we all know, the first step uh, in reusing or using a, a data set is to find this data. And metadata and the data should be easily to easy to find for both humans, researchers, and computers as well. And in that case, the machine readable metadata play a very important role in the discoverability and the findability of this data sets as well. And here will come the importance of the bids because the metadata that are assigned to them are usually globally unique and it can be included also within the resistant identifier. The second principle, which is accessibility. So once the user or the researcher in this case will find the required data, they would need to know how they can access and start using this uh, data. And here again, the persistent identifier through the metadata, which are retrievable uh, via the identifier, because it uses a standard protocol, will make the data, the research data, and its metadata information more accessible. And even when the data will not be available itself, the metadata information will always be there. Regarding the third uh, principle, so the data usually need to be integrated as we all know in the research workflows, the data need to be integrated with other data as well. This is how the research used. So I will use my data and build upon it different from different data resources as well. So the data should work within different application and it should be able to work also within different workflows. And this can be for different purposes, whether analysis or storage or processing purposes as well. And here the persistent identifier will play an important role as well through the metadata, which is stored within the persistent identifier and make it, it accessible and shared broadly and work in a broader way with different uh, system, and that will facilitate the knowledge representation as well. The last uh, point in FAIR principle, which is the reusability of the data. And this is the ultimate goal of all the four uh, FAIR principles, is to optimize the reuse of the data and help also to make these research data more uh, reusable. And this here will come also again the importance of the persistent identifier because it will, through the rich metadata, it can really help in the discoverability and reusability of the research data. So here a screenshot that I prepared or we prepared for the different bids and how they can work with different elements. So for we have for data and software, we have data site, our organization, and also IGS, and we are collaborating with them now. And for the publication like journal article or the data set, we have data site and the cross ref. And for the organization, as I explained, we have ROR ID for the research organizations as well. And we have for funder, we have cross ref funder ID and we have ROR. Is 
is providing support on that one as well. And we have research activity ID and CrossRef is working on the grants uh, and the project. And of course, we have within this workflow, we have ORCID ID as a unique identifiers for the research contributors. So why are bids or be resistant identifier are important? Bids like DOIs for object uh, items or ORCID IDs for contributors or ROR IDs for organization, they really increase the discoverability, accessibility, and they improve the ability of citations and reutilization as well. And they support the recognition of research output and resources. So this is the value of using these the different type of bids within the research workflow. So now I'm going to brief you very quickly about data site and my colleague Gabby is going to highlight more details about our infrastructures and our global access uh, program as well. So at data site, our vision is connecting research and identifying knowledge and we are even updating that. So we, our aim is to connect to research and advancing knowledge as well, which is something that we are really currently doing right now. So we are a non-profit organization created in the year 2009 by and for the research community. And this is a snapshot from our uh, values. Now I'm going to share it in the next slide. So our core cool values is we provide uh, UIs or ways for our members to register uh, DOIs and metadata as well that can help them to improve the discoverability and the reuse of their research output and resources as well. So we provide DUI metadata registration and we provide support and maintenance. We have also content negotiation and we have public open ABIs that we allow third party to harvest our metadata information. And we also provide to our members best practices, uh, guidelines and adoption for our community. So we have a user-friendly systems and software that allow them to register their DOIs. We have detailed best practice documentation as well. And we work with 100% with our community. So we offer community coordination through our team and we are always improving and uh, developing our metadata schema. On top of that, we build tools and services that allow our members to track the impact, the influence of the research as well through our dashboard and analytics and our har harvesting services and our graph APIs and the relation between the different metadata that we are uh, registering. So this is a snapshot from our current community as of July, 2023. So we have more than 2,800 institutional repositories, whether they are data repositories or institutional repository that are just collecting different or wide spectrum of research uh, output, such as data sets, uh, dissertation, thesis, text, images, different type of research output. And we're working closely with 280 members from 50 countries, and we have more than 51 million data site DOIs. And we are also working closely with more than 1,300 organizations around the globe. We have a wide spectrum also of partners that we work closely with, such as Center for Open Science, Research Data Alliance, CrossRef, and ORCID as well. So we work closely with these uh, international partners. We have also our own initiative. So in Jan, as of Jan 2023, we launched our global access program, GAP. I got hired under this in the context of this program. And at the same time, we have two colleagues. One colleague is working in Africa and another colleague is working in Latin America. And our primary goal with our GAP program is to foster the global adoption for persistent identifier within the local communities as well. We want to share and raise the awareness among the community about the importance of having bids in general, using bids in general for the research workflow and work with them in raising that awareness and increase the adoption in a global scale. 
We are also launching our Make a Data Account initiative, and we are working closely with the community on this. And the aim is to build policies around data citation metrics as well. So yeah, so keep an eye on our website, and there is a separate website for the initiative as well if you want to know more about Make Data Account. We are also taking an active part in different international projects who are collaborating with Crossref to build the uh, event data. We are also have our DUI or built with the community, the DUI citation for matter. And we are also working with the European Open Science uh, Cloud in the context of the FAIR Impact project. So we fully understand that it's a collective effort and it's a community effort as well. So what we had, as you can see at the base of our pyramids, we help our members to register DOIs and the metadata so they can improve the visibility and discoverability of the resources, the, re the different research output that they are registering by providing the DOI and the metadata, by helping and working with them and providing also open and public ABIs for third party to harvest and collect our uh, open metadata information. And then on the second layer, as you can see, we work with um, our members as well to help them to adopt and implement the best practices. So we have simple interfaces will, and user-friendly web interfaces where our members can register and can start depositing their metadata information. And at the top, we work with our members as well so they can measure the impact, the influence of their uh, research and the, the research also that they are funding by providing dashboard and analytics information and offering also harvesting services. So on the right side, you can see the different resource type that data site schema can support. And as you can see, there is a wide range of resource types that we can support. And as I said, one of the key messages that we want to spread is DOIs or digital object identifier can support and can work in a very good way with different resource uh, type, research resource type beyond the journal article. So they are not limited to the journal article. And in our metadata schema, we can support, for example, a book chapter, a data paper, a data set, a dissertation, a sound, a software code, uh, a preprint, a peer review report, a physical object that has been collected during the research process. And on the left side, you can find some information about metadata schema as well. Within our metadata schema, we have six mandatory uh, fields. The first one is the identifier, the DOI that we are going to provide uh, in this case. And then we have the creator, the title, the publisher of the work itself, and the publication year, and the resource type. And then we have another six recommended metadata field as you can see them, the subject, the date, the related identifier. And we have some optional uh, fields as well, such as the size, the format, the rights, the related item. However, in general, we advise our member to provide as much metadata as they can and to provide rich metadata information because we really believe that providing rich metadata can improve the visibility and enhance the discoverability of the specific uh, resource that you are registering. So we encourage providing rich metadata information. So now we talked about the tools, the ways that we provide in getting the DOI and the digital object identifier. The second part is connecting and finding that uh, where all these uh, DOIs are displayed and visible. So we developed data site uh, commons, our, our, our platform for displaying our DOIs. And we have also within that some DOIs that are coming from Crossref. And usually they are the DOIs that cited uh, data sets that has uh, that have got uh, data site DOIs. And within uh, Commons as well, it's integrated for with ORCID. So as a contributor, for example, if you have a data set uh, listed in data site common, you can add that work once to your ORCID and then your ORCID record will be updated as well. And it's integrated with ROR and with uh, repository registry re3 data. So you can find a data set through data site commons. You can also track the citation. So we understand that citation for research data, this is a new thing for the community, and we are building that as well. So within data site commons, you can track and 
find the citation for the research data as well. We are also supporting the recognition of the creators and their affiliation and their organization as well. So I, the last part in my presentation is regarding empowering the discoverability and how data site DOIs are visible and discoverable across different uh, citation and discovery databases. So the first example, so this is a screenshot that I got from Dimension. And as we can see, this is a data site DOI and this uh, data set is indexed in Dimension. We have another screenshot for this database, which is for a, a data set that is indexed in and listed in Google Dataset Search, which is an equal to Google Scholar, but for research data. And here also we have uh, a screenshot from Clarivate. So this is the provider of the journal impact factor. They are well known for that. And at the same time, also they have their different product, which is data citation index and using UIs, your institutional repository can, if you work with them, can be visible. Also, a new research data can be visible there. And we also, our UIs are discoverable in different databases. So this is ProQuest and OpenAir, and we have different examples, but for the sake of the time, I just brought these uh, examples as well. And at the end, yeah, we, I just listed some useful resources like data site, website, our global access program URL, and our roadmap, which is publicly available to uh, everyone so they can track our progress as well. Yeah, and all these slides and the recording, I think, will be shared, so you will have access to the useful links section as well. And these are our uh, channels to communicate. So please do follow us at all these social media platforms. And if you have any questions, you are most welcome to email us at info at datasite.org. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, um, Mohammed, uh, for uh, your introduction. And hi, everyone. I'm Gabi Mejias from DataSite, so now I will share my screen. And um, I'm going to um, speak about the DataSite infrastructure and um, the benefits both for institutions and um, researchers. Uh, so first, uh, let me speak about DataSite implementation. So how can institutions um, really integrate uh, our infrastructure into their systems and into their workflows? And um, there are three um, ways to do this. Um, so data site membership um, allows uh, institutions to uh, register and manage DOIs um, for uh, the repositories and also uh, for other kind of uh, systems. So uh, this can be done in three ways. Uh, the first one is a manual um, or um, user um, interface called Fabrica. Um, the second one uh, is uh, through using a registered service provider. And um, the third one um, is uh, through our APIs. And I'm going to go into more um, detail in the next slides. So um, the first one is um, DOI um, Fabrica. So this is a user interface that we provide uh, to our members. And basically um, you log in to this um, platform with your uh, member credentials and um, you can set up uh, or connect uh, your repository or other platform. And this provides a um, form where you can register the metadata and you can obtain at the end a DOI. So this is the easiest um, way to uh, start registering DOIs for uh, your organization. Um, however, um, we recommend uh, organizations to really enable uh, an automated process for DOI registration and um, this can be done in two ways. So one is through a service provider integration. Datasite uh, has a service provider program and we work with service providers 
that um, offer software uh, for repositories and other kind of systems that already integrate with the data, data site API. So this means um, these uh, software or systems already have uh, an integration. So uh, you as an institution don't have to develop anything. You just need to enter uh, your member uh, credentials into the system. And um, this will already um, activate the integration and it will already um, register DOIs for your outputs. And here um, I have um, the list of uh, supported integrations. So um, you can see that there are many um, repository systems that are already connected um, with data site, also Chris and publishing systems. And uh, the third way is um, if you um, don't use any of the previous mentioned system, um, then uh, you will need to develop your own API integration. So this uh, means to integrate the data site API into your systems or into your uh, workflows. So we offer a REST API. And this allows many functionalities. Uh, you can register and update DOIs. You can also uh, retrieve uh, DOI metadata. Um, so you can also uh, query more uh, granular uh, information like citations, usage reports, uh, provenance, and information about prefix prefixes and repositories. And if you're going to go uh, to through this way, um, then uh, you will need to do some tests before. We have two environments, a production environment, and uh, that's uh, where the live um, DOIs uh, get uh, registered. And for testing, we have a sandbox environment. This mirrors the production environment, uh, but just register tests DOI. So if you're going to um, develop your own API integration, we recommend you do test in the sandbox environment first. And now I'm going to speak about the benefits of implementation. So if your institution integrates um, DOI and metadata registration uh, in your repositories or system, um, you get increased uh, visibility and discoverability of your institutional research production. Um, you also uh, enable more recognition, both for your institution, but also for your researchers and those at your institution who contribute to research. Um, your institutional um, production also gets both exposed and connected to the global research ecosystem, uh, thanks to metadata and thanks to our open uh, registry. So very important to say that um, our members uh, register uh, DOIs and all the metadata um, they provide is uh, publicly and openly available through a CC0 license. So the metadata is open to all, uh, which also contributes to more visibility and discoverability. And um, thanks to our services and infrastructure, you can also track and demonstrate the impact of your research through uh, reports and analytics. And um, when you join data site and as, as an institutional member, you become part of um, our community of practice that um, joins to um, identify uh, research outputs and resources to promote open research practices. Uh, so I spoke a lot about uh, tracking um, impact, demonstrating impact through analytics. And um, we actually uh, provide a data metrics batch. Uh, and this uh, batch was created as part of the Parsec uh, project and um, is a way, an easy way and an open way to um, display both uh, citations and usage statistics uh, for your repository. Um, and these um, usage statistics are processed according to the counter code of practice for uh, research data and citation stats are collected via um, the event data that Mohammed uh, mentioned earlier. So the way it works is basically you need to uh, insert an HTML 
uh, snippet uh, into your repository, and then uh, you will be able to start um, tracking uh, citations, uh, views, and downloads. And you can also cust customize this uh, widget, so you can also choose um, how to visually display this information. So this is one option, this is another option, and there's more information uh, on the link. And if you implement uh, the widget, um, this is uh, how uh, we uh, expose this information to the global community through uh, the data site uh, registry. Uh, data site uh, commons uh, is the user uh, interface. And this is an example from the World Agrofor Agroforestry Center from uh, Kenya. So you can see all the, the works. Um, uh, the repository has, the citations, the views, and the downloads. And you can also find other information uh, like the war identifier for this organization and connected um, organization identifiers as well. And um, you can also see this as an organization from Kenya, nonprofit, and is member of a data site consortium. And um, you can also see some uh, visualizations uh, from uh, their production, and there are uh, more granular uh, details and graphics um, that I have not included in this slide. And um, also wanted to share some success stories from our members, as, as Mohammed mentioned before, um, we are a global community and we have members in across uh, 50 countries. Um, one of our members is the National University of Rosario in Argentina. And um, they recently participated in a webinar with us. And for that, um, they uh, shared uh, some success stories and testimonies from their researchers. And uh, here um, you can see uh, how uh, setting up uh, this uh, repository, they have a Dataverse um, repository and it's connected uh, to data sites to register DOIs. So you can see how this, this researcher uh, has benefited from this repository and says that um, they have uh, benefit uh, with more uh, visibility uh, through the data uh, downloads and citations, um, and that uh, depositing the data in this institutional repository um, allows them to, to have some peace of mind, knowing that um, if they ever lose the files, they will still have the data into the repository. Um, also mentioning this raw data that Dr. Francis uh, mentioned during his presentation, that they are depositing raw data so that other uh, members of the scientific community uh, can see uh, this data and reuse it for their research and promote more collaboration um, and um, that they get more visibility and social relevance uh, for their data. And here you can see the RE3 data record of this repository. Um, Dr. Francis also mentioned this initiative, data site is part of this initiative. We three data is the registry of research data repositories. Another success story from the uh, International Institute of Tropical uh, Agriculture in Nigeria, uh, which is also a data site member. And um, they also participated in a webinar recently with us to share their success story and then they mentioned that they um, benefit from uh, the uh, data uh, metrics that, that they are able to um, both measure the data, get citation uh, metrics, and have better insight on uh, their data uh, re reusability and their impact. Uh, they also, um, interest very interesting that they said that um, Integrating um, data site uh, into the repository enabled more job opportunities in their institution and also um, required uh, capacity uh, building and training. So they saw this as a, as a benefit and that the standardization of research data um, helped them uh, as well that data site, integrating data site uh, API uh, helped them standardize 
their data. Um, they also are developing uh, DMP templates. So they are opening up more information about the research process, which uh, is a way of uh, practicing open research. And um, this is a snapshot of the repository, which is uh, built on uh, CCAM. If uh, your institution would be interested in becoming a member, we have three different types of membership. Um, your institution can become uh, a direct member. Um, you can, your institution uh, could also become a consortium lead. Uh, we have a consortia uh, program and um, consortia, data site consortia are groups of five or more institutions that come together um, to implement a broader um, approach to implementation, for example, on a national or regional level. Um, and your institution can also uh, be a consortium organization, so joining uh, one of our existing uh, consortia. We have currently more than 50 um, consortia across continents. Uh, we don't have an Indian uh, consortium uh, yet. Um, so uh, should you be interested in um, becoming a member, uh, there's more information on these links. And of course, you can contact uh, Mohammed, who can uh, give you more information about the process. And finally, uh, how uh, we are trying to promote more equity and inclusion across uh, the research ecosystem. Um, so I've mentioned before that uh, we're a global community, that we have members in uh, 50 countries. Actually, we have uh, members in every continent except Antarctica. Um, but still, most of our institutional members uh, come from Europe or from North America. So um, this is one of the challenges uh, for the global adoption of this infrastructure. Uh, another challenge we've identified across the years is that in many countries, there are institutions that are interested um, in registering DOIs for their data, for their outputs, but uh, they lack the underlying infrastructure to do this. For example, um, they don't have a repository or a system that can uh, automate the registration of DOIs. Um, in some countries and regions as well, there's a low awareness of the value of persistent identifiers, uh, which makes um, uh, membership more, more difficult, and of course, uh, as well, financial barriers. So to address all these uh, challenges earlier this year, in January, we launched our global access program with the support of the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative to promote more equity uh, in the global research ecosystem. So what we want to do with this program is um, enable uh, more organizations across Asia, Africa, uh, Latin America, and the Middle East to access and benefit from um, our infrastructure. This program has three um, areas of focus. The first one is uh, funding. So uh, thanks to the funding we received from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, we will provide uh, funding to the community uh, to be able to um, develop outreach activities, uh, infrastructure uh, development um, using uh, or to be able to use our infrastructure. Um, we're going to launch the call for proposals in uh, September. Um, so stay tuned for more updates on this if you'd be interested in applying for funding. Um, we're also going to support the community uh, through technical uh, infrastructure. Um, so we want to uh, establish uh, partnerships with um, local and international organizations to support communities in these regions to uh, build technical infrastructure that can enable uh, them to benefit from DOIs and also outreach. So we want to partner with local communities that uh, want to um, work with us to increase um, the awareness of PD infrastructure and uh, this, this webinar um, with uh, Osan and I 
I, uh, SC is uh, an example of, of that kind of uh, collaboration. And the, the goal, uh, again, of this program is um, to have a more equitable and inclusive research uh, ecosystem. Uh, so we want to do this um, through uh, collaboration and partnerships. Um, we've also, as part of this program, um, we hired uh, three um, colleagues um, in Africa, uh, in Latin America, and uh, Mohammed in Middle East and Asia to support this program. And what we want to achieve is that all researchers and organizations and communities uh, have uh, the tools uh, and awareness to benefit uh, from persistent identifier infrastructure. And um, if you're uh, interested in joining our collective effort, um, you can start by registering DOIs for your research outputs and resources, um, include rich metadata. This is very important. The more uh, metadata you register when you register your DOIs, the more visibility and discoverability for your uh, research, uh, but also it's more information and context for, for others to understand how that research was produced and um, to share your success um, stories. We're always interested in knowing how the community is implemented and benefiting from our infrastructure. And uh, last but not least, um, to mention that implementing persistent identifiers is a way uh, of implementing the FAIR uh, principles. Um, and also um, through persistent identifiers and open metadata, uh, you can um, both implement and promote open research practices. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. And um, we look forward to your questions. Yeah, thank you, Gabby. I'd also thank Mohammed for a, such a nice presentation. And especially uh, since we are also moving in a direction where our institutions are also thinking on the line of data repository and also implementing more and more open science practices, which is the way forward. Uh, so yeah, thank you. And we hope that this is just the beginning of our collaboration and we go a long way to make science more open. So now I would make the floor open for question and answer uh, for the uh, questions to come in. Uh, if you want to ask it on camera, please raise your hand. I will call your name. Otherwise you can um, type your question in the, uh, in the question and answer box. So please uh, feel free to ask. Um, Meantime, I, I would go back to the, there are some questions which I will stick. Uh, so I think this is a question uh, to Dr. Francis. Uh, Dr. It's impact on quantity and quality of research with open research data, specifically in Indian context. Do you like to take this up, Dr. Francis? Uh, can you please uh, repeat the question, Monica? Okay, so someone is asking that what will be the impact on quantity and quality of research research if we make the data open, and uh, and specifically in Indian context? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, <clears throat> um, yeah, so as I said uh, during the course of my presentation, when uh, the data is made openly available, um, so it becomes uh, transparent and it becomes, uh, there's a possibility of uh, 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 someone reproducing that research. And then, uh, uh, I mean, in, in the process, uh, if somebody is uh, re-evaluating that data and trying to find um, the methods that has been used to draw inferences for a research work, whether it's correct or are there been any lapses or uh, uh, any uh, uh, biases. So now those things can be easily found out uh, only when the data is openly available. So when I, as a researcher, when I make my data openly, make, make my data openly available, so I, will, I, I should have the confidence, I should have the integrity uh, to ensure that my data, uh, I mean, uh, the fact that I've made my data, so whatever inferences and whatever conclusions I've drawn out of my research is uh, 
is uh, of, is of high integral value and surely surely um, uh, it will improve uh, the quality of uh, research work because i am daring to put my data open and uh, the research output is of course already published and if somebody wants to reproduce it the data is already available and uh, this will have an impact on the quality of research of course uh, I see a hand raised, uh, Syed Anas Ali. Can you please uh, ask your question? I don't see the hand raised anymore then. Uh, I will take I think there are questions. One question was there uh, to ask that uh, where the data will be stored uh, because data set will provide a DOI, but where the data will be stored. So Francis, you will take that up as, as yes, yes. And then we can go back with that question with Gabby and Mohammed as well. Yeah, see, uh, uh, now if you are using uh, discipline specific or subject specific uh, repositories like uh, Zenedo, or uh, the Harvard uh, Dataverse. Now, uh, it becomes the responsibility of uh, the data repository, centralized data repository to assign a PID and uh, the data resides in a, in such cases, it resides in a central repository. Now, on the other hand, if you set up your own institutional repository, the data will reside in the respective institutional repository and the institute which implements the data repository will most probably use an open source software. Now it could be a CCAN or it could be Dataverse or any other open source software. And all, all the open source software meant for uh, creating and managing data repositories provides the facility of integrating uh, digital uh, PIDs. Okay, so, uh, uh, so as an institute, I set up my data repository, then I coordinate with the data site to obtain uh, a PID uh, that is a DOI for my repository. And going forward, when every time a data set gets ingested into my repository, I assign a, a DOI for that data set uh, and uh, it becomes uh, globally resolvable. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Francis, for explaining the process. I would go with um, both Mohammed and, and Gabby as well with the question because they already are providing such kind of a device to many repositories to explain a bit more. And also I would uh, have one more question, and this is the last question, is that uh, there's a question about file format because all disciplines, the data that we generate, can be in various format because some discipline it's more modern some some image file for some discipline is just data file some discipline it can be in very various formats so what do you see there how the data repositories are, uh, are solving this kind of challenges thank you both of you please yes um so regarding the previous uh, question, as uh, Dr. Francis mentioned, um, the, the repository is where uh, the researchers uh, deposit the, the data or the files or the content. Uh, what data site provides is the infrastructure to register identifiers, POIs for that data, but we don't host uh, or hold the files themselves. What are registry uh, hosts is the identifiers and the associated metadata so that in in regards to the previous question and in regards to the to the second question um we uh yeah uh we do not have any recommendations around file uh formats or metadata allows um though to uh, register information about um, the formats and the size of the file. Um, uh, in our metadata, uh, though, um, we allow uh, XML, JSON, BibTeX, and uh, RIS as uh, metadata formats. 
and Mohammed uh, or Dr. Francis, if you want to say um, anything else on this. Uh, I think I do agree with you completely, Gabby. You almost provided a very detailed uh, answer for uh, for this. Yeah, uh, yeah. If I can just pitch in here, uh, the file file format is not a concern actually. Now again, uh, the, the same question used to come up uh, during the days of uh, setting up institutional repository for research publications. Uh, so, what type of file formats would the repository support? Now that 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 is not the concern of the respective repositories. Now, re respective repositories, I mean, as far as a data repository is concerned, will predominantly hold the raw data. Okay, so it is up to the people who are interested in using these raw data to download the data and then use whatever uh, additional uh, software is required to make use of that data. So the objective of a data repository is to hold the data and the file formats uh, is not of a concern. File formats will be of a concern if uh, there has to be uh, uh, interoperability, the ability to be able to merge uh, different data sets for uh, more complex research issues. So then uh, for the sake of interoperability, then the file formats uh, uh, concerns may be there, but otherwise uh, in a normal course, uh, the file formats uh, are of not concern as far as a uh, data repository is concerned. Thank you, Dr. Francis, uh, for providing such a detailed answer. I think that right now it's very clear that how data repositories will be functioning. Uh, there were a lot more questions was there, but I think Paul took care of it by providing various links. So we can finish it on time, on our time, five o'clock. So with this, I would end this webinar. And as I already said that I hope that this is just the beginning of our journey where we can collaborate and make at least one functional data repositories in India with DOIs so that our researchers can submit their data and that can be citable. So we can start with that. Thank you all for joining today. And thank you, uh, Dr. Francis and Gabby and Mohammed for your wonderful talks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mamita, for being uh, such a wonderful MC. And uh, thank you, Mahmoud. Thank you, Gabby. And uh, thank you, all the participants, for your very enthusiastic participation, uh, enthusiastic and also active participation. So we look forward to having more such programs and um, hoping to have more data repositories coming up in the country in the days ahead. Thank you very much. Have a fantastic day ahead. Thank you so much, everyone, and looking forward to expanding our collaboration with you and with Indian institution as well. Thank you. Thank you all so much. So, uh, thanks to Jahanab also as for making this infrastructure available and the, all the team at uh, CPR. Thanks, everyone, thanks. then. We end Thank it you. here. Yeah. Have a nice Bye. day. Bye-bye.